Okay, here we go. I'm going to start all over again and welcoming you to the Wadsworth Area Historical Society program tonight. And it is on the history of the coal mines in the Wadsworth area. And the reason I am videotaping is because there's another group that wants to see this particular presentation. And this group isn't in Ohio. In fact, they're not even in the United States. The group is over in the United Kingdom. So when I visited over there a year and a half ago, I visited a small town called Hucknell, which is close to Nottingham, uh, a little bit northeast of London. And one of my former students lives in that town, and he's active in that town, and he selected that town to live in because it reminds him so much of Wadsworth. So as we were finding connections between the two towns, they were also a coal mining community about the same time that we were. So they want to hear all about our coal mines, and uh, so this is going out to them. So again, getting back to uh, the presentation, yeah, if you still haven't found that, where's Waldo Mule? Right there he is. So again, this was taken, I believe, at the, um, the coal mine that was out on Akron Road, 261, close to where Giant Eagle is today but I'm not always certain on some of these because the old timers are gone that knew a lot of that information. So, what is coal? Well, I think we've all experienced coal in our lifetime. I brought a chunk of coal with me. I got this for, for, for at Christmas one year. <laughs> First year, got, it was very small, but the last uh, Christmas, it got bigger yet. So anyway, it's a type of rock, and it's a sedimentary rock, and where did it come from? It came from dead and decaying plants and animals. So the pictures up here will show you that uh, part of that coal could have been dinosaur, it could have been some of these ancient uh, plants that grew, and again at one time Ohio was in the middle of the tropics. And um, so plants grew very big and animals grew very big. Then, of course, we went through those uh, days of uh, the Ice Age and it killed off all those animals and kind of um, made our uh, temperatures back to moderate. And so we don't have the abundance of the plants and animals, at least the size-wise, as we once did. So when they died and decayed, all their stuff went to the bottom of the swamp and uh, other places and that went on for millions of years and over those years it just kept causing a layer and a layer and a layer eventually um, when the ice age came and the ice caps grew and the water levels fell um, those swamps dried up and eventually got covered over with silt and um, just through erosion and eventually more and more dirt got on top of that goo and it got pressed down deeper and deeper and once you compress and the heat and compression under the ground made it form into rock and so that's what I'm holding here is a bunch of dead plant and animals over a million years old so, um, pictures of coal, and again, it's a sedimentary rock, means it's made of sediments, and in this case, plant and animals. So, in prehistoric times, if you look at this map, you will see Ohio is located in this area. This uh, represented the swamplands and oceans. At one time, oceans, that's why you can find fossils in Ohio, um, made out of sedimentary sandstone, that type of thing. And um, so, once the ocean's covered here, and that's why beneath us is also a layer of salt. So, the salt came from the ocean when they dried up, and all that salt precipitate uh, stayed above ground and then eventually got covered up with dirt and got pressed down deeper and deeper in the ground as things eroded and stacked up on top of it 
So we have two things. We have salt mines and coal beneath Wadsworth. Now the salt mine moved down to Ripman uh, after the one in Wadsworth um, went bankrupt. And so Wadsworth at one time was known as the saltiest salt. I don't know what the coal was ever known as, but it wasn't the saltiest coal, but uh, maybe the most burnable coal, I don't know. But it was a high grade of coal that was uh, beneath Wadsworth. And here was our first coal miner. He was one of the first guys that came, and that's not an actual picture of him, of course, because we're going back to the early 1800s. But that's John Holmes, who lived, or at least squatted, down at Holmes Brook, and that's how Holmes Brook got its name, so just off of College Street. So he was, um, he was a squatter that came down here, and he hung out with his Indian squaw, and eventually married the Indian squaw. And so they nicknamed him uh, Indian Holmes, not as a compliment, not as a compliment back in those days, but that's what they nicknamed him as Indian Holmes. So he had a log cabin along Holmesbrook, close to College Street, and um, he kind of trapped those bottomlands, and he traded with the Native American Indians that roamed this area. Um, he also he set up his own little, uh, well, once he discovered coal, and he saw the coal in the side of the hillside there along Holmesbrook. So where the houses are built, there where the hill is, uh, Holmesbrook Hill. He saw the outcroppings there and started taking out the coal, and he set himself up a little uh, blacksmith area, and he would make weapons for the uh, Native Americans, more tool-type things, not weapons as far as uh, hunting animals and that sort of thing. So um, he traded in furs. He also um, you know, made those tools and implements and sold them. So I kind of put him as the first coal miner in Wadsworth. Now when the first pioneers came in in 1814, he went and helped them roll up their log cabins, which meant he helped them roll up the logs to stack them to build their log cabins. So. Um, he has kind of a sketchy history to him. He came fr from Canada. Some places say he was French-Canadian. Some say he was British. I think it was probably a combination of the, both. And he was on some kind of mission where he was to deliver goods to a, a place up north. I don't know whether it was Detroit. And somewhere along the line, the things he was supposed to deliver disappeared. So the people gave chase. And he just hid here in the woodlands of Ohio and just to stay away from being caught. So whether he stole them or they, he got robbed and uh, they were holding him liable for it, whatever the case, he came here. So he was a drifter. Once those pioneers came in, he helped them get them started, and then he headed west into the wilderness again. So he hung around for a little bit, helped some people. But then when he saw the population was getting a little bit too uh, uh, much for him and maybe thinking he might get recognized, he took the Indian squaw and headed farther west. So in 1829, some of the farmers were finding down here in the Silver Creek area, uh, they were finding coal also uh, along those hills down through Silver Creek and also just digging down. Um, I don't know how far they, they had to dig down, but maybe what happened was they were digging their water wells and suddenly came across the coal. Whatever the case, they discovered it and said, wow, you know what, we can use this for our fireplaces. Now, wood was in abundance there for the, when everybody came here because this was an ancient forest that was cut down. And so people used the trees initially, but trees only last so long and then they start deteriorating after they get cut down. So they discovered the coal and said, okay, now we have a supply of heat, and they were our first coal miners. So there are different types of coal mines that were in Wadsworth. There were three different types. There were the drift mines, and as you can see with the illustration up here, and they basically went into the side of a hill, and this was the coal and they just 
kind of burrowed straight in right along the seam and pulled it straight out. And that's what you would have find along uh, Johnson Road, for instance, uh, where Silver Creek went through there. And so they just burrowed into the sides of the mountain. These are some, so they'd be more like caves. And you can see this, not, this is not Wadsworth, this is not Wadsworth. I put these pictures up just to give you an idea. They would run the tracks straight in, load up the coal cars, and bring them straight out. And the mules would pull, pull them out. Oops. Then you had the slope mine, similar to the drift mine, except those go down at an angle. So I kind of parallel it with a groundhog. Over in England, I guess it'd be a hedgehog. But a groundhog, of course, uh, it burrows down and angles down and finds however far they go under. And ironically, they then pop straight up to put their den up high. So if you ever tried to drown out a groundhog, good luck. You keep dumping your water down, but they're up on a shelf that they had built and looking down. But I guess that was a thing they'd have kids do to occupy their time. So anyway, a slope mine would go in, angle down, and find the seam, and there you go. And they would um, have smaller coal cars that would go down that hill. In fact, what they would do is the foreman would get there first thing in the morning, and he would take the coal cars, and he would push them and get them started to roll down to the bottom. And then as the miners went in, they found their car. And from there, they pulled it as far into the mine as where their area that they were to work and they loaded up their own car. Each coal miner had their own car. They initialed it with chalk or so something to identify it. So when they pulled the cars out and weighed them, then that particular miner was hooked to that coal car and got paid accordingly by the ton. Oh, and I also put up here, this is a uh, underground underground map of the White Spar Mine of 1898. Where was this located? Well, you can just make it out, but it says Line Road. That's Eastern Road. And here's County Line Road that goes uh, north and south. So basically, it's where Silver Creek Park is. And when they were building Silver Creek Park, I don't know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, whatever it was, as they were dozing and scraping away and scraping away, all of a sudden, boom, the dozer dropped down. And they couldn't figure out what happened. Well, they dropped down into the coal mine. Now, granted, the coal mines were only this deep, about four foot. So we would all, once if we walked into a coal mine, you'd be bent over walking into it or maybe five foot at best, but, and the coal cars only stood this high. But again, uh, so they dropped down, and they got the old maps out, and guess what? They dropped down into the White Spar Mine. And so that whole lake over there is built over the old mine. Yes, sir? I excavated company. My brother and I put the, all the roads in the Silver Creek Park. Okay, did you fall into the mines? We didn't actually fall in, but there was a lot of filings that we dozed over in, uh, as uh, we put in uh, uh, roads in the uh, beach area there. Okay, excellent. Well, it's always good to hear from people with first-hand experiences with the mines around here, that being one of them. Okay, next slide. All right, last but not least, there are the shaft mines. The shaft mines in Wadsworth would have been at the north end of town. So if you're up there... Uh, doing your march through Walmart, think of a shaft mine uh, 100 to 120 foot below you. So up in the north end, that's the um, section where, well, obviously, there's a rise as you're going out of town into Sharon Township. And so it's only natural. There's not a whole lot of hills up at the north end. So they had to go straight down to get it. And... Um, Again, that's where they go down and then go horizontally through the coal. Um, this guy, Mr. Hutchinson, I think it was, what, 1939, 1940, 
he came up with the idea that's an old air shaft. So obviously when you're that deep down under the ground, not that the others didn't have them, but it was most important to have the air shaft to allow the bad air to come out and the good air to go down. Now they did have steam engines up at the north end that would run fans to blow the air down to keep it clear. Otherwise you get the methane gas collection and that type of thing. And uh, so you had to be extremely careful and so he came up with the bright idea that right before World War II, he was going to reopen some of these coal mines and start uh, digging out more and more coal. I'm not sure it ever came to be because pretty much by World War II, at least by the end of World War II, coal was pretty defunct in this area because of uh, newer technology and quite frankly, it was pretty much all taken out. So our coal mines pretty much met, its, met their peak in 1880. Now, they still went into the 1900s, uh, but 1880, I think it reached its zenith. And they started uh, around 1860, right when the railroad came through Wadsworth, because then they could market it. Before that time, just the farmers used it because they really couldn't sell it. The, uh, they couldn't get it out of here. But then once the train came through, they had a way of transporting it out of Wadsworth and to bigger markets. They did have the canal in 1845 down around Clinton and Canal Fulton, but that was a lot of work to haul it all the way down there, unload and come back, and of course the boats couldn't handle the uh, extreme amount of coal that we're looking at here. And here are the two biggest coal barons in the area. There was Erastus Loomis who lived in Wadsworth, and there was also Ellis Collier, what an appropriate name for a coal miner, Collier. I think that's what Collier means, is someone who works in the coal mines. So Ellis uh, lived over in Doylestown. So I put these on here because of um, really the Silver Creek area down into Rogues Hollow, Doylestown, that area. That's where lots of the coal came from. But we don't want to leave short the north end of town either. There's also an abundance uh, of coal up there. But these two guys were the ones that pretty much ran the businesses around here. Now, Loomis was the one who um, put the money up to build uh, where the old Ben Franklin store was on Main Street. Now they're putting a winery in there. It's the old brick building next to Carolyn's Cupboard. So um, that was built in 1868. And it was Loomis and Traver that built that. Traver being the guy that had the carriage factory that also lived in the museum. Um, so Loomis was a big businessman and he was instrumental in bribing or donating money to the railroad company to make sure it came through Wadsworth. And of course it's at the south end of Wadsworth because the hill was too big to get up to come into downtown Wadsworth. So they had to find the flat area um, of Wadsworth and that was the closest to the downtown area. That's what, why it was placed there. But anyway, back in those days, they kinda said, oh, we're gonna put train tracks in this area and people pretty much bidded on them. And so he got businesses to support it. And by doing that, he outbidded Western Star because actually Western Star was bigger than Wadsworth in its day. And it would have eclipsed Wadsworth had the train gone right through Western Star. But it went so far south of it, and it came so close to Wadsworth, Wadsworth prospered, and Western Star turned into a ghost town. But it could have been the opposite way. And then I'd have to change up my whole presentation. <laughs> So again, the Ohio Canal came through 1828, 1845. You can see this is coal in the bottom here. Baby's keeping track of that coal, make sure nobody steals it. But that was the first transportation. Then uh, the Wadsworth, uh, the railroad comes to Wadsworth in 1863. It's interesting because we have an old atlas over at the museum that was uh, printed in 1857. And the railroad tracks were printed in it. 
six years before they even put the actual rail down or open. So they pretty much had an idea that it was going to go there. Otherwise, they wouldn't have put it on the map six years before it actually opened. Um, but anyway, this is an example of a steam train. So the steam trains were the first ones to come through. It was a single track through Wadsworth. And Loomis was one that came up with the idea, hey, these steam <coughs> engines are coming through. They need fuel. So his first order of business was the lumber company, or was lumbering. So he cut down trees, he split, cut them up into sections, split them, stacked it, and sold the wood to the steam engine engineers or businesses. And then, of course, when the wood all got depleted around here, they pretty much stripped all the trees uh, everywhere for farmland. Just like you drive into Amish country, all you see is farmland. That's what Wadsworth once looked like. So in this case, once they stripped all the trees, now he thought they can burn coal. We can dig coal, we can sell coal. So Silver Creek, right around Silver Creek Road crossing, that pretty much became the hub of activity for the coal mining industry. If you've ever been to the trolley line park, the new park, the trail that goes down there, that house was kind of in the heart of it all because right on the other side of the trees is the railroad track and that's where the Silver Creek station was, the way station, and the tipple. So they describe it in the history books that it was a quarter mile from Silver Creek Road headed west. So that puts it right about where that house is. That's about a block from there. So a lot of activity there, the weighing, the separating, the shipping, and also spurs coming into it. One of the spurs came off and followed Silver Creek all the way down into Rogue's Hollow. So it caught the, some of their northern coal and brought it back to the main line and off it went. Now the spur that went up to the north end, that spur, uh, just picturing it, uh, pretty much went through where Sacred Heart's parking lot is today. You probably all if you grew up in Wadsworth, you'll remember that set of tracks. Goes along Auble Street, crosses over, went past the Ice House, or Hornoff's Heating now, yeah. keeps going through Durling Park, and that would go through Bent Creek, if you're following me, and head up through that valley and go up to where the um, Galaxy is, all the way up into the Weatherstone development. So it would gather up that coal on that track and bring it south to the main line. And the interesting part of it, now they didn't put full-size trains going up through there. They were the smaller trains. They were more just to pull the coal cars down and um, reload them down here at the main line. So they had portable tracks. So they would take up the tracks when they were done with it and then reset them down to another area, just like you would do a, a model uh, railroad set that you can move the tracks and do that sort of thing. When they built Bent Creek, I don't know if you remember this, there was a newspaper article saying as they were excavating there, they came across this bridge that had railroad ties on it. And they were freaking out, wondering what was going on there, and then they finally searched the history and saw that that's where that spur went up through there. And that's the one thing they didn't remove. They didn't remove the bridge. They left it and took up all the rest of the tracks. <clears throat> and people have reported finding tracks <clears throat> down, <clears throat> down Far Avenue and in that development, Red Rock area. So again, I'm also throwing out neighborhoods that if you live in those neighborhoods, just make sure you have mine insurance <laughs> because they did go through there oak street maybe not to the south oak street but everything down over that hill that's where in that valley is where the coal mines were did you know leo brogan had a coal yard back of the catholic church here and one of the brogans did leo brogan. leo coal. back in the 50s wadsworth coal and ice henry coal and ice you got henry yep. and henry We'll bring them all in. Well, I talked to the one Brogan who just passed away um, this past year or about a year ago. 
he stopped by the school and he spread out a bunch of the things that he had because they had he worked the coal mines out between Wall Road and Johnson Road in that section so it was interesting to listen to and I did uh, copy some of the things out of it actually was out of his ledger books and how much they were selling coal for you know, to their customers cool okay now we have the uh, Wadsworth Railroad map of 1903. So just kind of follow here with me a little bit. This is, this is going to Ripman. So we're coming in from Ripman. We're getting here to crossing Main Street where the old depot was just here. And then heading out east. This is the spur that goes up to the north end. So again, it's hard to see in here because we didn't have that many streets. So it was out in the country at that time. And now the streets, you know, are covering up everything. And you can see it juts through the uh, valley. This is 261 right here, Akron Road. This is Bent Creek then. Durling Park would be somewhere down in here. So... You know, it went up there and made a sharp west. This would be Clark's Corners. As you go up and uh, turn left and then jog right. So the railroad spur went right up there to where the most recent cave-in was. This is uh, probably close to where Great Oaks Trail is or McDonald's for some of you that uh, use that as a landmark. So I probably crossed right around there and then angled up here. It pretty much stopped up in this area and again now we're up in Sharon Township. Just a tinge. If you live in the um, Weatherstone area, get insurance. <laughs> Cost five dollars a year by the way. You know, I'm not aware that they did because that's more of a surface. I don't know if they had to dig down that deeply. Now, somebody told me, and I'm not sure this is accurate. They just said the other day, <clears throat> when they built the Wilhite development across from Pine Valley Golf Course on Reimer Road, they said, oh, yeah, they spent tons of money uh, drilling holes down into the ground and filling them with cement. And ironically, those don't appear on the map. One of the things that uh, I want to point out is um, when I show you these maps and what the city shows you that's hanging up in City Hall, it shows you where the coal mines are. So when you come into town, hey, I want to build a house in this area. Uh, I'm going to build here. They'll say, well, you can look at the coal map here. And they look at it and say, oh, well, it doesn't go under my house, even though I live out there on Reimer Road. Those coal mines at best probably represent 25% of the coal mines in Wadsworth. They had to, you know, the ones that were registered and were corporations, they had to go through all the paperwork and uh, all that stuff. But if farmers did it on their own or there were private businesses that did it, and who knows how far they left their area and went under the neighbor's property. So... It's something to start with, but I wouldn't end there. The mine that you see in Carts Corners was kind of directly behind Dress Brothers, if you know what Dress Brothers was. So where the interstate was, was just a little bit south of there. So the northern uh, was Cardman's mine, and uh, that was a 100-foot deep shaft. <coughs> it was still open in the 60s. They never, they never closed the mine up. Well, yeah, a lot of them, they never officially closed the mines up. They left them open. Now, they do flood after a while because if you're down in the coal mine, you have water dripping down from the ceiling because in many cases you're down below the water table. So it seeps down through the sandstone and through the slate and finally into the coal mine. So they constantly had to be running pumps to keep them dry. Um, but once they pull the pumps out, eventually they all fill with water and that helped stabilize them 
So that's the good thing. Uh, the bad thing is then it's also rotting the oak timbers that's holding things up, but because it's not getting as much air and oxygen, so it does slow down that process of decay. There's a train track in the back of our woods. The, rain, the bed is still there. Mm -hmm. um, we have our woods at the end of Park Center Drive. Okay. It heads to the east, mm -hmm. goes to the farm next to ours, which is the Vance Farm. It turns south and goes un across the interstate highway. And the Radiant Life Church, which has that new church, yes. mm -hmm. has the wood line in the back of it. Yeah. That's train bed also. Mm hmm. So, yeah, it went right down through and the Hain Farm. Um, they own property there behind the Galaxy because their farm got cut during the highway when the highway went through. But um, I know John Hain has told me that, yes, that you can see the railroad bed through the woods there. So, yeah, it went up to the north end and it caught whatever it could. And like I say, there could have been other spurs that weren't recorded because. Maybe they were down temporarily, and then they moved them, um, and that was just their whole process. This is the cold tipple, and I believe that would be the Silver Creek um, station, and you'll see a closer look. This was the Wadsworth Railroad Station at one time. Nothing more than boxcars. The reason being is the original depot, which I do not have a picture of, uh, and I've never seen a picture of our original depot. It burnt down. So for several years, we didn't have a depot, and people complained to the um, um, railroad. And so they said, here, we'll put up some offices. So they pulled in a couple of boxcars, and, and I believe that's probably Willie there, boxcar Willie. <laughs> So eventually they built the uh, depot that some of you may have remembered that they tore down in the 70s. So that was the second real depot, but the third according to the uh, railroad. This map uh, is very hard to see and deal with only because it doesn't show streets. But basically this is the rail coming from Ritman. Again, it makes that bend in Wadsworth, the depot, oh, actually the depot's up here, I'm sorry. So the depot's there, then it swings down. This would be pretty much behind Trolley Line Park because you can see these little spurs coming off. The main goes towards Barberton, there it says to Akron, but this was the spur that came off right there at Silver Creek. It'd be right where that um, Trans that electric transfer station is on Silver Creek where the railroad crosses. So that huge area there, that would have been uh, where the railroad spur would have gone. Met up with Silver Creek and followed the creek because, as you know, the water follows flat with a slight uh, angle. So Johnson Road. If you remember where Wadsworth Furniture was, they're on the hill. It's that particular hill that they used to have a bridge across. Now you go down the hill, it's all paved, and you go back up. But because of the train coming through that hill, they had to put a bridge above it. So eventually, when the railroad was taken out, the bridge was taken out, and now the road goes like this. So I found that interesting to find that old picture. There's another view of it. I've cleaned it up a little bit, but yeah, it's, uh, it was quite a long haul there. But again, today, that's nothing more than the dip in the road. Okay, who were these coal miners? Well, most of them, or many of them, were Irish. It's only because when the Irish came across, when they left the famine over in Ireland and they came looking for jobs here in the United States, they would take anything, any job that you would give them. So their first worst job was digging the canals by hand. So they worked on the canals. Many of them died because of the swamps and the mosquitoes and the yellow fever and malaria, whatever. 
And then when the canals were getting out of vogue, the next best thing was, hey, let's work on the railroad. And so they helped lay the tracks and again, hand dig, hand stack, taking gravel, putting it down, doing all the work that the English didn't want to do. And then after the train came through, once the train was done, what do we do now? Well, you get the job that nobody else wants. And that is go down in the dark and dreary coal mines. So many of them were Irishmen that uh, worked the coal mine. And so you'll see that uh, a lot of names pop up that are Irish names uh, reading through history. It's kind of sad reading about their families. A lot of them lived along the railroad tracks and uh, a lot of tragedies beheld them. And, uh, and the Irish were good drinkers too. So there were a lot of reports in the police log back then about the Irish fighting in the saloons. Now they worked all week and come Friday night and Saturday night, they did whatever they wanted to do. Hence all the legends of Rogue's Hollow. So if you've ever read the books on Rogue's Hollow and all the saloons that used to be in that little quarter of a mile stretch of territory down through there, and um, they had a lot of knockdown, drag out fights. <clears throat> and then, of course, from there, legends start coming out. And, you know, everybody from Jesse James to Bonnie and Clyde hit out there, according to the legend. And that they had counterfeiters down there that were making coins and sending them. So it goes on and on and on. But that's how it all came about was just this uh, tough lives. And downtown Wadsworth was no picnic either. And so there were a lot of uh, brawls in the saloons. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, going back, you can see young miners. This is not a Wadsworth picture, nor is this. This one is. And you can see the protective equipment they put on the mules. They used mules because they were shorter and much stronger than a horse. And, uh, and some of these poor mules, especially up the north end in the shaft mines, they would be down in the, the shaft mine for six days, and if they were lucky, they were brought out on Sunday for one day. So many of them went blind because they just weren't exposed to uh, bright light. And this is what a typical shaft, or a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a coal mine would look like, and especially because we had the abundance of wood around, at least initially, they would shore up the ceilings and shore up the walls with uh, logs. And that's what you can see here, holding things up. And that's, those are the things that are still down in there. But again, with this filled up with water now, you know, the buoyancy of the water would hold, <coughs> you know, some weight. But as these eventually rot away, now it's been, you know, well over, uh, what would you say, maybe close to 100 years, so 70 to 100 years ago, and, um, but I guess eventually when you take from the earth, there has to be a balance, and uh, so they made it rich off of uh, the coal in its day, but ironically, we'll probably end up paying the price in the long run, just replacing houses if they do settle. And again, the coal mines weren't that deep, so don't fear that you're going to be living in your house someday and then all of a sudden be sucked down into a hole. You know, we're not in Florida. We're in Ohio. <laughs> but what has happened to the houses is the foundations drop. And all it takes is dropping a couple of inches and it messes up your whole system. And then they condemn your house because, you know, they don't know what the infrastructure is like, etc., etc. And then you're in for a a runaround for the next year or two as you try to settle up with an insurance company if you have insurance. If you don't have insurance, it's a complete loss. And some of those people that had loans on their houses up at the North End, I'm sure they lost, well, they had to bankrupt. That was their only way out is to bankrupt because, you know, otherwise you're paying on a mortgage on a house that you can't fix or you can fix, but it's going to cost you probably the same amount as what you paid for the house. <coughs> so even the lady, the one lady that did have insurance, they were still fighting it a year after that. 
because Ohio law makes you um, get a couple of quotes on what would cost to fix the house. Well, no builder wants to quote on it because they know they're not going to get the job because they know nobody does that. They end up tearing, tearing down the house in the long run because it's too expensive, so why waste their time quoting it out if they know they're not going to get the job? So then you can't turn it into the insurance because you don't have your, your quota of quotes. So again, unfortunately, it just turns into a, quite a quagmire. And originally, um, their lights were the lard lamps, and you can see having a fire right above your uh, eyebrows was probably not the safest thing in the world. And in fact, if there was a methane gas leak down in that mine, uh, that's why it doesn't have any eyebrows. So they switched over to a carbide light, and I did bring one in. And basically, you fill the uh, top of it up with carbide, which are crystals. Or actually, you fill up it, put it in the bottom. In the top, you just add water, and then you adjust it as it drips, drips, drips. And you have to be careful your drips. You don't want to drip too much because it builds up pressure as there's a chemical reaction, and the gas comes off of it. So the gas is... Um, forced through a tiny opening in the front. That little orifice there at the front, and you light it with a blue tip match, by the way. <laughs> or they didn't have big lighters, so anyway, they would light with a match, and it was like an acetylene torch, well, it basically. It creates acetylene gas. Yeah. So, um, and you can see the shining, and that made their light. They also had a built-in lighter, I forgot about that. So you could put Flynn in there and uh, flick this, just like the old-fashioned cigarette lighter. So they, that was their equipment. They had to have a helmet. And I can tell you the helmet didn't, um, didn't, <coughs> didn't help a few miners because usually the, the accidents weren't minor, no pun intended. Uh, many of them would be simply just walking through the mine and a chunk of rock just peels off overhead and would come down and smash them as they're walking beneath it. Now, little pieces of rock, yes, they could come off, but because most of the time it was slate, it came off in big sections and many lost their lives that way. And the mining equipment. So what they did is they had a hand drill or a hand brace, and here is the drill bit. So I don't have a hand brace that fits this uh, three-quarter inch end, but they would stick that back into the rock or into the coal and start screwing it in to make a hole, go back several feet, almost three foot, and from there, pull it out, and they would get their stick of dynamite, the ghost of the miner, and they would put their uh, stick of dynamite in there, and using, you know, some kind of probe, they would make sure that uh, they would hook the fuse to it, and then just kind of push it back into the rock, have themselves a very long fuse, I think mine would be about a quarter of a mile long. <laughs> And every evening when they were done mining, that was the last thing they would do is they would blow out some more coal to pick up the next day. So the last thing of the day, they would stick their dynamite in there and um, light it and get out of the cave. And it would explode. And by the next morning, the dust would have settled and they could go back in and start mining again. Now, some of them they did in a series because it was a long tunnel, so they would all go in the, together and everybody would uh, light their dynamite. Then the next guys are coming out, and as they're coming out, and uh, you sure didn't want to trip over each other on the way out of there. And then there were accidents, of course, where they would light their dynamite, they would go out, and they're waiting and waiting just to make sure. Uh-oh, nothing happened. Then they'd wait longer. 
nothing happened. The fuse went out. They'd go in there and uh, try to see what was going on, and suddenly yeah. it would explode unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And of course, then they would be buried alive in coal. So those things happen. Um, just anything that could happen, happened. I mean, um, you know, there just uh, weren't a lot of safety things involved with it. And uh, so you'd get the gas leaks, of course, and that would overtake people because the, if the ventilation wasn't working, and a lot of times they didn't know it if they were working in the mines, and unless they had a parrot or a parakeet that they put on their shoulder and see whether if it passed out, then uh, you better get out of town. All right, you can see as he's pushing the uh, dynamite back in and setting the charge. You know, they do pretty much the same thing up in uh, under Lake Erie when they're getting the salt out. I did have the opportunity in my lifetime to go into the salt mine under Lake Erie. I got to go through the, uni through the University of Akron. And then one time I had a friend that worked in the coal mines down around Caddis and... Uh, I think it was okay, but he says, hey, did you ever see, uh, the, have you ever been in the coal mine? So we went in after hours, he had a key that unlocked the door and uh, had to put all the safety equipment on. We went down the elevator and got into the, that car and you just kind of sat there angled like this because again, low ceilings. And uh, at one point he turned out the light and he says, this is what pitch black looks like. And it was the darkest black you've ever seen in your life, or didn't see, or could have seen, whatever. But uh, it was interesting because uh, you had to open and close doors, ventilation doors along the way. So we'd get up so far in this electric car and say, well, get out and open up the doors. And we'd go through and then close the doors behind, trying to hold that air into the different pockets. And we got out alive, believe it or not. I can testify. Scared me at one point. So loading the coal cars, they're in there with their pickaxes. And hunched over and just chopping away and chopping away and then throwing it into their car. And again, their car was marked. They put their initials on it. So when it was brought back up, it got weighed. However, before it got weighed, it also got screened and they would place it on screens that would shake back and forth to make sure that the rock, it would, that um, just other sandstone and other type of rock got separated from it. Well, in the same action, some of the coal went down through too. So that turned into a real big issue at one point because there were some miners who cheated a little bit and they'd see rock and they would throw it in there. And Loomis got word of it, and so he said he was going to reduce the size of the holes in the screen. Or, I'm sorry, enlarge it. He would enlarge the holes, which meant more would drop down, and they wouldn't get paid for anything that went all the way down through. And that fired up the miners, of course, to the, to the point that they went on strike at one time. Uh, there's the mules and miners. Sounds like the name of your favorite brew pub, Mules and Miners. <laughs> but again, just showing that that's not a Wadsworth picture, it's just giving you the idea. And then you had the pickers. Now these particular pickers are picking it, picking the coal and separating the three different categories. So some of the tipples had, they would take the rail car up and dump the coal down, and as that was going down at an angle, it was going over different screens. So, um, you know, the smallest screen would be at the top, it would catch the smallest pieces of coal. And uh, I think they called that the nut size. This is the size of the walnut. Then the next screen down would be a little bit bigger opening, and uh, not sure what that was called. I think I may have it on a slide. But as you see, if it slid down to the third screen, then it was the larger. And that's the way they graded them. So they're doing it by hand. So they're separating out. 
Uh, I, I suspect each one had a job. You get the big stuff, you get the medium sized stuff, and you get the baby stuff. And there's that article there about uh, Wagner. And it says at the height of the coal era, the Wagner shaft at Wadsworth was producing 1,000 tons of coal a day. Then the industry bogged down. Today, the shaft is being reopened by William Hutchinson, and he stands near the opening of the old mine. Um, this is now being used as an air shaft uh, on the new diggings. But again, I never heard anything after that, and I believe that was right around 1940. And a hard day's work, again, bent over and coming out of the coal mines. Now, this is an authentic picture over from Rogue's Hollow. So that was, those were the houses that they built for the miners that, um, that they brought in and gave them living quarters. Notice they don't have basements. They're all just up on stilts. So it was not permanent housing because I figured they... They figured someday that the, the coal would run out and these houses would maybe be moved to some other location. But that's in one of the um, Doylestown history books. And that was a coal tipple that, again, the Rogue's Hollow, Doylestown area. And again, you can see where they would um, bring a coal car up and tipple it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd have to, I, I think different ones operated different ways, but again, I know I uh, have the layout of, you know, there's kind of the layout of a cold tipple, and again, it's, it's hard to really understand, but the, the car is tipped right here, so you'll see a coal car at an angle, and the coal is coming out, and it's going down this and it's dropping out into the different sizes. Okay, so the Maslin coal field, that's why I mentioned before, it extended from Akron to Talmadge through Norton and Wadsworth to the southern border of Stark County. So as you go down Route 21, that was pretty much all coal mines in that area. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. There you go, and thank you for shopping Walmart. So anyway, um, Norton across County Line Road had a lot of coal mines there on the, obviously, the east side of uh, Medina County. So basins of coal range from a couple of acres to a few hundred acres. So there were basins or like big ponds of them. So there could be gaps in between. And again, it just goes back millions of years ago. Where was the lowest area and where did stuff concentrate? Uh, the thickness of the swamp seam, which would be the muck at the time, was anywhere from five foot at its max and dwindled down in all directions. So imagining a bowl that goes like this, the thickest uh, seam would be at the center of the bowl, and as you go out, of course, the, it gets less and less. And again, the 4,500 tons of coal could be taken out of an acre. And the coal was not mined if it was less than two foot thick. The reason being, did you ever try to crawl into a two foot thick <laughs> hole? Yeah, and swing a hammer. So that was pretty much, if they could crawl in and get to it, but once it got below two foot, it was too hard for them to squeeze in, and it wasn't practical to knock all the rock around it just to get to that, that uh, seam. So the Wadsworth Township coal mining. Coal seams between... 50 foot and 150 foot below the surface, it was bituminous coal. Screen separated into, there we go, there are the grades, the lump coal, the nut coal, and the slack. Slack would be the tiniest. 
and the coal was broken up by miners using picks and wedges and sledges and then shoveled into coal cars. Again, you have to remember that coal is one big rock when you come across it. You have to blast it and make it into smaller pieces. It's the same with the salt vein under Lake Erie. It's just one huge, when you walk in there and you look at a wall, it's just one big piece of salt. So every night they put blasting uh, uh, caps into the salt and they blow it up and by the next morning it's all cleared out as far as the dust and they go in with the front end loaders and just scoop it up and put it into conveyor belts take it to the surface um, miners miners earn from 50 cents to 85 cents per ton and four cents more bonus for every three inch below a four foot seam so in other words, four foots here. If you were working at what, a three inch or three foot nine inch place, you got extra. If you were working in a three foot space, then you were paid extra. So again, the thickness of the seam determined your bonus. A miner could extract and load between two and four tons per day. So do the math. Uh, each miner assigned a number. Coal car was marked with chalk. Steam engines operated elevators and fans. Kids were hired to open and close the doors, the ventilation fans. Uh, in 1878, the Geological Survey of Ohio depended, uh, determined that three quarters of Wadsworth Township was underlined with coal. Wadsworth had the largest mines in northeastern Ohio back in its day. They reached their height in the 1880s. Train branch ran from south end of Wadsworth through Durling Park, crossed Akron Road, followed Hartman Road to Clark's Corners and west on Reimer, right past Weatherstone area. There's an old map of 1897. And again, just getting your, getting my bearings. This is about where that trolley car, or the trolley line house is. <coughs> right, Tom? You live there. Right around C. So you can see where it split off. This is uh, Silver Creek Road. This is Johnson Road. So again, just putting in perspective here. Weaverville was a hot spot. Here's a Barbara Reese. You relate to her, Tom? No. You're the only one with the last name Reese in here, I think. You can see a large coal mine down here. And this puts you right about where the, um, well, like I said, be here. Silver Run Winery is. Here's the high church. Silver Run's about here. This is interesting because this, this spur came off of, well, across Johnson Road. And um, it, if you're out along Johnson Road and driving down that new development that has the pond in the front on the south side, and Castlehaven is the name of the street. If you see Castlehaven, I pretty much believe the railroad spur went right down that street and out the back end all the way down to um, Eastern Road. And the reason they ran that spur is because there was a fellow there that grew up on this farm and his name was Dr. Everhard. And Dr. N.S. Everhard was one of the big brains behind, or he was actually a doctor number one, which is notable enough, but he was also kind of the brains behind the uh, investments of the E.J. Young companies. So he was like president, and uh, E.J. Young was the owner because he depended on his uh, economical mind to keep them uh, in the black all the time. But anyway, he grew up on this farm, and there was coal on the farm, so they mined that coal and brought it back to the south end of Wadsworth and used it to power the match company and the injector company back in their day. So, again, getting a little bit of a monopoly on things. Uh, the long farm out here 
which is now the, uh, the Marin Farm, if you know where that's at. That was a big coal mine. Um, right, surface, this is Surface Road that comes off there. The, the big mine right there? The, uh, this one? Number 10, yeah. I have a friend who has a working blueprint of that mine. You know what? And I think we have one over at the museum. Somebody gave me a copy. Whoever was selling copies, they must have sold a bunch of them. Bruce Akers. Yeah, Bruce. He's the one that gave it to us. Yeah. yeah. So he doesn't have it anymore. It's not the house. That is a huge mine. Yes. Huge. And in those mines, a lot of times you were, oh, <laughs> you were assigned, um, how do I do this? Is there a previous? Um, Sometimes you were assigned, you know, your own tunnel area, you know, rather than just, um, yeah, your own chamber as such. Okay, that's the one that uh, we just saw. And then we go to the next one. This was 1897 also, I believe... Um, Oh, again, this is uh, Akron Road. And guess where this is? This was a huge coal mine, the Brewster coal mine. Yeah. yeah. And the place next to it, to the north. They're built right on top of that baby, that church. And you can see where that spur kind of ran a little bit parallel to 261 and came up and met with that spur. This is a spur that goes up to the north end. This is Clark's Corners up the north end. This is where the latest cave-in was, right at that intersection. Um, you know, going out towards uh, Will Heights and Pine Valley, you sure don't see any coal mines marked. But they found holes down under the ground. Okay, this is the map that they show you at City Hall and say th this is where the coal mines were. And, and all they can do is go by what is furnished to them by the state of Ohio. These were the ones that at least got registered. So here's downtown Wadsworth again. Here's Akron Road, Hartman Road. Giant Eagle area. Summit Extension down in the valley, Far Avenue, big blob there. Now, why they didn't have uh, coal mines maybe in these areas? Well, probably two reasons. Number one, that maybe there wasn't any coal there. It's pretty hard to see all these droppings up here. And the other thing is, if it was broken down into smaller farms, you know how hard it was, especially in the downtown area to get everybody to sign off on their coal if they owned the mineral rights be be below their house. So farther out in the country where there were big farms, you can get the, uh, the um, mineral rights you know, between two farms and then you get yourself a coal mine going. When I was told too that back then they didn't have pumps that would carry water out at great, great heights and some of the coal ran deep. Yeah. They had to give up because they couldn't get there. Well, I believe it. And the legend is, you know, when they abandoned these coal mines up at the north end, because eventually they had heavy equipment down under the ground, they left it there. So it's flooded and preserved. So some people look for the di Titanic. We need to drill some holes up there and send some divers down to find the old equipment there. Um, you can see here, this is the Blue Sky Drive-In. So that was a biggie, crossing the street. This is where the high tension wires go across. A lot of times when you see high tension wires, you know that that belongs to an energy company, which may have belonged to the coal companies because they all go hand in hand. So when you see where they cross, more than likely, if you follow those, you're gonna come across a coal mine area. That caved in in front of the blue sky one time, too. Had to close the road for a long time. Well, I believe that because across the street, as it goes uh, under the high tension wires, I used to hike back in there, 
and I would come across these openings and they always had trash in them and I didn't know what they were. I thought, what kind of people take their trash back here and bury it like this? But it wasn't like it was spread out. So I asked the neighbor and they said, oh, it's the old coal mines. In fact, it's our trash. The kids kept walking down in the old coal mine, so we started sticking refrigerators and stoves down in it. Okay. So that was along Wilson Road, where I lived on Wilson Road. So if you go down the dead end, you get to the high tension wires that then go all, all the way up the target area. Um, so I came across several of those holes directly, or pretty much directly across. This map is the same one that's up here. So. I had printed that one out for the last uh, presentation. The red area are just low swampy areas. Um, so this is like the, um, this is Holmesbrook, and this would be River Sticks, I suspect, just doing a quick look at it. So the valleys, which are also the lowlands. And you can see the yellow is where they had coal mines. So they kind of follow that same pattern of being in the low areas. There's Wilson Road. Um, this would be somewhat behind, well that's closer to the railroad tracks, but this may not go out far enough to catch that uh, blue sky one. So Bent Creek, I put road up there, so right down through there. Walmart. Well, what did Supposedly happened, I talked to a guy I graduated with, and he said, you know, when they were building that stuff up the North End and Clark's Corners, they kept saying, you know, you're building on top of coal mines. And they said, well, that's where we're going to build. <laughs> and he said, so they built uh, Home Depot up there, they put the parking lots up, and they put that big retention basin up there. He said, the first heavy rain, that retention basin almost overflowed and all of a sudden there was a sucking sound and all the water disappeared in like seconds. It found its way to the middle of the earth. And ironically, that's close to where those houses then eventually went down. If you look down by the railroad tracks here, down on this is the same one. Down on Silver Creek Road. Keep going over. Uh, You'll see the, where the the uh, high tension lines are the, the actual control center. Oh, okay. Down, right. Over, that's all undermined, and uh, they they were told not to build there because of the mines, and they did it anyways. And they they put thousands and thousands of cubic feet of concrete into those mines mm -hmm. because they opened them up when they sunk the shafts for the towers. Well, ironically, for a different reason, I was just reading an old article about how in Ripman when they built the salt down there and they built those buildings on there, of course they built on top of a swamp down in Ripman, and, but they wanted to make sure so they put some deep pylons down under the ground and the buildings still sunk once they loaded them up with salt. So they didn't have the mines to worry about under there, they just had the water in the swamp. And that's why they put the salt down there. One of the reasons is because it has more abundance of water that's used to pump down to suck up the salt or to dissolve the salt and suck it back up. Okay, this was the same map, but I put arrows in, giving you an indication if you live east of this arrow, because that's pretty much where the coal mines. So I say use an imaginary line from uh, River Styx down to the high church. And even the high church is, uh, you still have to go a little west of it. So. That's where the concentration is. If you're a west sider, southwest, there are no mines at least marked out anywhere. So again, when people say, where were they? They were pretty much in the northeast. Okay. I will get my final view. That's just an old uh, coal car that's on display down the Rogues Hollow at Chidester Mill. If you've ever gone to that park off of Hametown. Uh, another tipple, that map over there is the map that I've kind of cleaned up and put over here of the Rogues Hollow area and also the South Wadsworth Township. Oh, there were mine tragedies, that's not a real Wadsworth thing, but again I mentioned a few of them of the coal coming down on people. 
I told you about how the foreman would get there first thing in the morning and push the coal cars down. Well, one day he got there late, so the miners got there be ahead of him. They assumed he had already pushed the coal cars down. They started down there with their mule, and all of a sudden they heard this rattling coming down. And boom! They got smacked. Fortunately, the mule got the worst of it. Took him out, but I think uh, one out of the two uh, boys or young men got wiped out too along the way. So again, the tragedies of those and instant death where he's killed by a premature explosion of his dynamite. Uh, rights for coal mine victim, uh, that's Harry Williams and the Williams coal mine was there at the um, Blue Sky Drive-In. He dead. Um, so again, some of these other coal mines, 250 people worked in these, just those two coal mines. This is kind of redundant, talks about the same things about um, there on the Boffman Farm. Now, part of the Boffman Farm is, again, where the trolley house um, is. That was part of the Boffman property. The Germans lived in the south part of Wadsworth Township. Um, this one was nearly killed. He lit a fuse in his room, then retired to an adjoining room for the blast. He didn't get far enough away. <laughs> I found that, at least it wasn't tragic. Um, minor name of Welsh, about 64, was killed at the New Slope Coal Bank when hit by a piece of slate rock. So that was pretty common. Uh, miners went on strike in 1876, and Loomis says, I'm going to beat you at your own game. He sent some representatives down to Virginia, and he re recruited blacks, loaded them up, say that there's um, black gold up in Ohio, and you're going to get rich over mining. And this is post-Civil War. They didn't have jobs. They got released as slaves, and they were looking for work. They came to Wadsworth. What they didn't realize is they were strike breakers. One of them was Auntie Lee, and she lived in Wadsworth until her, she died. But anyway, after they found out they were strike breakers, some of them turned around and went back home. Some of them stayed here. And when the strike was over, they were pretty much out of jobs to begin with. So some of the blacks moved into Wadsworth. They lived on Mill Street. And all the black families that I grew up with were pretty much a result of that migration caused by the coal mines, including Annie Lee. Um, again, they were brought here. And another coal company, 80 people, 150 tons a day. Wagner and Gerschenschlager uh, produced 1,000 tons of coal per day. And uh, there's a better view of the Silver Creek station. There's a closer view of the tipple. Notice again, this is out there around Silver Creek and you don't see any trees around. It's farmland. And the Williams and Brogan mines, they were last to operate. Williams mine where Blue Sky uh, was closed in 37 after one of the brothers was killed by falling slate. And then Claire Brogan closed his mine in 1938 prior to WW2 as workers were drafted into the army. It was between Wall and Johnson Road. And I talked already about the Chippewa mine. That was N.S. Everhard that sent it down there to bring the coal back to run the companies. The Brewster one out there at uh, Giant Eagle. Well, actually, they had several of them. They were kind of the first ones. They called uh, 600 men over 1,000 foot deep. She just won't give it up, will she? <laughs> so anyway, it just, uh, kids in the mines. That's not a Wadsworth child, I hope. And here's some of the mine dam damage. This is the one on Johnson Road, Roger Polk's um, house that he owned. You can see what it does to a basement. This is the one up at Clark's Corners. You can't see a whole lot, but poor Mrs. Pelfrey walked out to her kitchen one day and uh, her house had dropped 6 to 12 inches, her kitchen. <laughs> she, 
She thought, I never had a step there before. <laughs> uh, foundation of some of those, that's what it does. Abandoned minds fill up with water, memories, and uh, Caesar isn't here to tell the memories. But I've already talked about these things. Oh, they did say that uh, theoretically there was a tunnel that you could go from where Bueller's is all the way up to Weatherstone and be able to walk the mines, open mines. Did you do that, Michelle, as a kid? Yeah. Is this a short story because they're kicking us out? Okay, well, thanks for coming tonight, and hopefully you learned a little bit about Wadsworth Coal Mines.